Hello and welcome on behalf of the Museum of Art and Photography and the Bangalore International Center to Design in India, Contemporary Expressions and Traditional Languages. We're very pleased to have with us today for this last session as part of MAP's Creative Connections theme, themed fashion designer, David Abraham of the Fashion House Abraham and Thakur, as well as the co-editor of Handmade in India, textile designer and educator, Aditi Ranjan, um, their full bios can be found in the chat box. Um, and if you have any questions for either of them through the course of this conversation, please feel free to send them in via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, without taking a lot more time in introducing what they're really going to talk about today, uh, I'd like to really just dive in and invite David to tell us a little bit about um, his design vocabulary and his practice at A&T uh, that draws upon local Indian and art, uh, Indian art and craft traditions. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I think, uh, and thank you, Shilpa. I think you have given me a very good introduction. And um, I'll just start, actually, um, but I have to make this a disclaimer. I have to make a disclaimer in the beginning that I was taught by Aditi Ranjan so, who was a very, very influential part of my uh, journey as a design student. And in fact, I think a lot of what I studied at the NID under her and her, and her colleagues has actually influenced the way our company has uh, approached design over the years that we have. So now I've got that out of the way, so now I can just carry it on. And um, so, you know, we have always believed that um, we needed to find a, a voice for fashion in India. When we started, it was somewhat challenging, which was now nearly 30 years ago, because the whole fashion construct in India at that time had been completely imported with the, when uh, the National Institute of Fashion Technology, NIFT, was uh, established in Delhi by the government of India. The curriculum and the teaching modules were all brought in which was excellent because they did bring in the basic structure which taught fashion. But then as we began to see it, the, the Indian construct and attitude towards fashion and the way we consume fashion began to diverge. And it became, um, and it, it became a challenge because we began to realize that we needed to find a, an approach to clothing that reflected our climate, our seasons, uh, the way we live, the fact that we have different patterns in the way we sit and the way we move, and uh, you know, uh, you know, all the ways in which we wear clothing, besides of course occasions, and also in terms of the fact that we have completely different seasons. We do not follow the international calendar for seasons. So this, in a sense, began to inform our work. And the the slide that you see right now is from an early collection of ours, where we did. Uh, the, all the fabrics were developed, designed and developed in Mangalagiri, which is in Andhra, where we worked with a cluster of handloom weavers, which we have for many years, right from the beginning, and developed shapes that were all based on the Mangalagiri, which is a simple tabby weave, and uh, developed softer shapes. And as you can see, we've always played with sari border, because the classic Mangalagiri saris have a very simple border. And we were trying to see how we could use that fabric and construct it into clothing, which we could use here. And even for menswear, as you can see, menswear, we work with jackets, but you made the jackets in a softer handloom fabric, which for us really breathes much more easily. And it has the comfort of a shirt, not the constructed, uh, the classic tailored jacket. So uh, these images are from that collection. So Mangalagiri was one that we worked with. E-cut is another uh, technique that we worked with very closely right from the beginning. And in fact, we continue to always do, always do a new collection in E-cut because E-cut I think is absolutely extraordinary as a technique. I mean, it's a resist, uh, resist technique where the warp and the weft in two-way E-cut is tied and dyed with, all, with the most incredible precision. It's a mathematical process that has been developed over hundreds of years. And the craftspeople who do this, the weavers, are extraordinarily talented. This is another, and you can see we can get pure color with uh, double uh, with double e cut. So we play again the border, the traditional border of a sari, 
is actually just done through uh, two-way A cups. And uh, the white is pure white and the black was done also. So it is not necessary to have complex pattern like uh, in the earlier image. This again is a famous, you know, it's a black and white thing. I think I, for us, it's very, this was really our first collection that we ever did. We launched the brand Abraham and Taco at the Conrad shop in London with these very same designs, especially the one on the right. And uh, that has been the foundation of a lot of our work. Here again, playing with simple graphics, but using double E cut to explore them in different shapes. And uh, here we move into a more uh, complicated technique, which is uh, brocades from Benares, where, you know, uh, they use the jhalas, which is the, I think it predates the jacquard in many ways where it's a very, very complicated system of instructing the threads of how you pick them up and drop them so you can create these patterns. And the wonderful thing is because we're working with very skilled hand weavers, we did not have to repeat the pattern across the five and a half meters of the sari. We actually did a drawing, we traced it a, tra a, a drawing five and a half meters long of this pattern inspired by the leopard spots and braided it right through the sari. So the entire sari is, is just woven in one continuous length and the pattern doesn't repeat at all. This is the magic of the hand loom, and which is why we feel that there is nothing that can replace this uh, for us. Um, and also being trained in textiles first. I think, you know, our clothing is very, very informed by the whole uh, weaving process. We can, in fact, I think every fashion designer in India uh, is actually benefited by this particular background because we work with the cloth and then we work with the garment. So that creates a, a, a completely different synergy. This again is Benares, very complicated Benares weaves, but in the simplest graphic check. But if you go close, you'd see that the checks were completely engineered. There was, that there were patterns within the checks itself of very fine twills and broken twills. So again, we were playing. I, this is a close up of a similar, but we, this is from a recent collection, uh, which is different patterns. And this was inspired really as a kind of homage um, to our uh, mentor, one of our mentors, Martan Singh, who did the famous Vishwakarma exhibition and in which he put these different patterns in, together in different fabrics. So we try to recreate that in Zari, it, uh, the uh, brocade weavers of Belarus. Um, here we move to block printing, which is also a very, very, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of our, it's a technique we re return to frequently. Because as you know, every single block can create an individual pattern. There is, you can create surfaces that are completely different. And here we were playing with the sari. This was collection was based on menswear. So we, the patterns were derived from men's weaves, suiting weaves, the Prince of Wales check, the broken twill, the herring bones. And we printed on the saris and then we stitched the shirts as the blouses and printed on the garments after they were stitched. So we were able to engineer the patterns into the uh, garment itself. I mean, all this is just what you can do when you're working by hand with very skilled craftspeople. Every single piece is individual. So block printing. And here now, this is also a continuation of further uh, experiments that we did with block printing, where we realized that you can also create flat plane surfaces. To print does not mean, it is not necessary to have a motif when you print. You can just print a flat color. So the plain black, for example, in the trousers on the, on one side on the far uh, right for me is uh, just black gud printing. We use the background gud to print the black, which has a completely different texture from a dyed black. And because we were printing it, we were able to leave the negative stripe at the side. So everything is printed into the garment, the shirt too, and even the jacket on the far left. So this is the, this is the speciality of hand block printing. You do not have to print continuous yardage. You can print for the actual garment. So as you can see, fashion for us has really been about expressing uh, these different, uh, you know, these, uh, expressing these techniques in contemporary clothing. Uh, similarly here, the jacket on the left, those pockets, those negative pockets are actually trompe-l'oeil, they're not pockets at all. We printed the entire jacket in black and just in printing, background printing, and just left in the negative impression of a pocket. There is no pocket there, but it's just a tongue-in-cheek comment on how you can play with uh, textile technique. This is a collection we work with Kanta, which is a hand running stitch. And then we worked, we also interpreted using the machine by layering layers of fabric. 
we've always been very interested in this technique because it's one of the earliest forms of uh, sustainable fabric. It's very fashionable now, but you know, Kanta is really about recycling old saris and old fabrics in West Bengal. They hit upon sustainability and recycling much before it became a buzzword. This is again another version of it, inspired by a steer hide, where individual patches were put onto a, a layers of oil and then Kanta together to create these contemporary patterns. Um, so, you know, we've covered all these different techniques and um, I think, you know, this sort of sums up a little bit of how our work, our approach to design is. Um, I think that, you know, it's one of the most important things that as a designer, as a practitioner who's designing fashion in India is this relationship, as I mentioned earlier, between craft and fashion. And it gives us designers the most incredible resource. A, because of this completely incredible scope of technique, we are the last, we are really the last place in the world where all this can still be done and done practically. It's not a, you know, an esoteric craft. We have the largest skill base of craft people in the world. And I think to join that, to marry that to contemporary design is very, very important. And uh, our work has, a lot of our work has been involved in that. At, uh, in that direction of creating these links between fashion and craft. So Aditi, would you, can I invite you to weigh in on this at this point? Yes. Um, thank you, David. I'm very honored and proud to be sharing this platform with you. Um, I don't feel the difference between <laughs> a teacher and student at all. So uh, it's my honor. Um, I think uh, an important thing to also um, you know, I realized and I've, I've been feeling this when we talk about why textiles and knowledge of textiles is very important for fashion designers and apparel designers is because I think textiles is one discipline this amongst the other disciplines like product design, furniture and the other craft traditions where we actually have to make a material first, you know. You don't have to make wood, you don't have to make metal, but you have to weave cloth. So in a sense, um, it is quite different, uh, even in terms of, as you say, why textiles are, why it's important to learn and have an appreciation and understanding of our textiles, not only because of our rich heritage, but also because of the fact that you have to first make your raw material. Of course, there are other techniques such as felting and other ways in which you can form and shape products uh, without using woven cloth or without interlacing threads. You can do it from other composite materials, but the bulk of it, I think, comes from interlacing of threads. And, I, and therefore, I think the richness of the Indian traditions is so enormous a resource and a wealth, a, a real wealth that we must protect and we must conserve and, and not just protect, but we must help that it continues and is, is kept, the traditions are kept vibrant and alive all the time through reinterpreting and reimagining tradition, which is what I think is the message of your slideshow. I think it is really an excellent example of how you can revisit tradition. Um, you're also, I think, sharing with the world um, what you appreciate about the tradition, you know, because we get to know this through the way in which you select to uh, reinterpret ikat or to reinterpret or the clever ways in which when you do um, a two-layered quilting, you, you just form the border or you uh, form a contrast by showing the underneath layer. So very, very important, you know, clever details like this, which show your approach and your sensibility. So David, you mentioned something about um, these traditions being, um, you know, sustainable at a certain time, like the Kanta that you were talking about, um, before sustainable became a, a sort of trending thing um, to practice. In. So maybe you want to, could you talk a little bit about sort of the ecosystem within which um, all of this happens, right? The artisans who are 
um, sort of small communities, the fashion designers, the end consumers, sort of just uh, the larger structures within which all of this operates. Yes, you know, I, we were talking, this has been a subject which I think concerns a lot of people now. And particularly in this current crisis that we're going through, I think a lot of questions about consumption and sustainability have begun to you know, in, uh, engage a lot of conversation. And I'll go, I, I touch upon a point that Aditi just mentioned when she said how important it is for us to sustain these traditions in India. Um, to elaborate on that, we, the reason, there are, there's many reasons, but I think, you know, uh, we need to look at two things. When we talk about sustainability in India, I mean, sustainability in today in the world, the focus internationally is about, correctly so, carbon footprint, waste, uh, overconsumption, a lot of problems which are connected, of course, with the first world, with the developed world, not so much with ours, because we don't have, the, we don't consume our per capita uh, levels of consumption are much lower than anywhere else in the developed world, for example. But um, these are very, very important. Uh, these are very, very important um, uh, issues. And um, with craft, you also, you begin to realize that the reason why, one reason why it's imp imperative for us to sustain it on the, from, the, uh, from the sustainability point of view is the craft industry is based in small clusters, is distributed across the country. The environmental footprint is tiny. And you are not just in the physical terms, you are, people are creating things by hand within a sustainable ecosystem, with it scattered amongst, you know, across, across the country. Not, we're not driving people into huge anonymous, anonymous factories in cities and living in, you know, in uh, subhuman conditions. People are living within these environments. So within that, from that perspective, you know, it's very important that craft is a, is a very important part of our manufacturing process. But beyond that, sustainability also for us in India, unlike uh, internationally, also has to be concerned with the sustainability of livelihoods. We don't, they, they, this problem doesn't exist internationally because these livelihoods do not exist in most countries of the world. In India, we actually have this is the second largest, the, the handloom and the textile industry are the second largest employers after agriculture. We have to remember that. We are sustaining traditional livelihoods. We, are tradi we have to sustain these traditional livelihoods. A, of course, because they produce this extraordinary wealth for us, because we are, and two, because of, because of the very nature of the systems of production, which are, in, which are sustainable. And if we don't, we are not, we are also have, uh, you know, we are sustaining also the, the makers of our material culture. You know, we cannot afford to lose that. If we lose that, we lose, we lose a link with everything that makes us what we are. So it has to be, it, it's imperative from these, both these perspectives, sustainability of, uh, you know, uh, in terms of physical or uh, environmental uh, reasons, and as well as from the cultural reasons. I think both these are, are, are very, very important. And of course, you know, as we all know, uh, Indian textiles are possibly, and not possibly, I think they are just the richest in the world in terms of technique and in terms of the, the width and the level of skill is extraordinary. So if, um... Maybe Aditi, you could sort of um, step in here. And uh, when we're talking about the expertise of all of these, um, you know, the artisanal communities, the fact that there are um, so much rich histories that you know they, they collectively uh, recall and that they collectively embody, um, uh, could you perhaps talk a little bit also about how? Um, you know, we're looking at traditions that aren't really static. So it's not just uh, expertise that is, you know, merely um, one technique, but we're also talking about a range of responses that those techniques have evolved with over time, whether it's motifs, whether it's actual technique, whether it's response to certain markets, etc. cetera. Um, yes, I think, um... As, uh, as David said, that uh, uh, craft traditions um, not only embody 
sustainability in terms of the resources and for the planet, but also uh, very important that the material culture and cultural, it, there should be a cultural continuity, you know. So why do anything about crafts, you know, why can't they be left to die and new things will grow? That can also be perhaps one way of looking at it, but I don't think uh, that's, how, that's what I'm proposing. But uh, what I mean to say is that why is it necessary to make sure that they not only survive, but that that's a very, there's a very vibrant and, and a lot of vitality in this uh, in the craft traditions. Um, I think what's important is that um, the, the craft uh, traditions embody a variety of uh, concepts. Um, and some of these have to do also with our, um, what would I say? Some of these might uh, touch upon ideology and philosophy. Uh, there were times when we, um, you know, there was times when, or there are times now where need has become greed, perhaps. And you find that there are designers, there are young designers, like some of our graduates, uh, Maku Textiles, for instance, in Calcutta, uh, where, they, where their uh, philosophy is uh, that you should, uh, you know, they offer only indigo dye. They offer only one dye, whatever you can do with shades of indigo and white. White is not a dye, it's a natural color. Uh, so that they're not pandering to all kinds of uh, tastes, you know. The, otherwise, if you're in the market, you have to offer many, many colors and the colors have to change according to seasons. But here is one philosophy that says that, you know, we offer only blue, we offer only indigo, which is a very, uh, there's a very strong reason why we only promote this one color and you better choose from it, you know? And I think that's an important, um, it's an important way to educate, uh, you know, philosophically and ethically because uh, sometimes we go overboard by asking for a great choice and a lot of range and, so I think the traditions are not only about, uh, these are repositories of knowledge, but they're, they're a storehouse of knowledge and not just for techniques and materials and uh, designs, but also because of certain values. And I think those also need to be um, spread and those also need to be imbibed and those also need to be nurtured. So one of the examples, as I said, um, you know, what Maku Textiles uh, says that they want you to only look at blue as a color, you know, or look at white as a color. There are so many shades of white, you know, that perhaps if you look at a lot of the crafts and I am going to show them in my presentation, that there is a sensibility unfortunately, in the export market or in Japan, uh, which would, uh, where the natural color has a very, very strong and high appeal for them. Uh, and it has great uh, significance because it means you don't pollute the water, you don't need, even uh, natural dyes require a lot of water and require to grow plants and, you know, uh, we might uh, overrun the garden with plants for natural dyes, you know, everybody starts doing it. So I think uh, looking at some of these which were intrinsic to some of our traditions. So the whole uh, range of white clothing, and I think white is a, a color that is used uh, in men's clothing and women's clothing. It has many cultural, different cultural meanings, but uh, with a little pattern or even without a dyed pattern, uh, dyed uh, introduction of a uh, of a dye. Uh, there's a lot of texture and a lot of uh, design and the pattern that uh, can satis should satisfy us. So I think there are a lot of values like this, uh, which are uh, and which also our traditions embody. They also embody intangible aspects like in the northeast, uh, a lot of work related to textiles. 
uh, or even in different parts of India, amongst handloom weavers communities, where the entire village or several households help the weaver in doing processes like warping or street sizing of the warp. So all the pre-weaving processes, I think is done collectively. I don't think people who come and help to put up a warp are paid. But when you look at um, uh, maybe uh, the same sort of situations, uh, workshops in the cities and in urbanized areas, then every task has to be paid for. So there is um, a lot of collective effort also related to many of our traditions. And it's not just the craft of making uh, where products are made and textiles are made, but uh, lots of instances in the Northeast where an entire village in Arunachal Pr Pradesh uh, walks down from their village up in the hills to the river, which is many miles um, downhill to build a bridge and goes back to their village only after the bridge is built and nobody pays them. You know, this is something that they do as a collective effort. So there are many of these instances, which I think as designers, we need to understand and see if we could bring that also in some way as a process, because design is not only designing a product, it can be a process, it can be a system, uh, it can be a service. So perhaps we need to look at some of these which are uh, I were intrinsic to some uh, craft traditions, especially in the Northeast, and you still find them in some pockets in the Northeast, because so, I think uh, they're, uh, uh, they were very self-reliant. They made everything in their environment, in the built environment, they made it themselves. Of course, these are these times are changing now, but if we can um, also revisit some of these values. So before we move into Aditi's presentation, David, I'm, I'm going to yeah. ask you to respond yes. on um, the thing that she's talked about in terms of you know design philosophy um, and in terms of maybe looking at how design can be a collective process and how that might reflect or you know what your sort of take on it would be in, in your own practice um yeah well i think you know the whole the whole uh, history of the way uh, a lot of these crafted textiles and products has been done uh, demonstrates you know this because it was an integrated system in which it fitted in and in which it involved the whole ecosystem we are now Fortunately, unfortunately, I mean, I don't think that's we are in any position to sort of evaluate. I mean, we can't really pass a judgment to that. Living in a time when there is, of course, a lot of uh, industrial production, and we, that is not going to change. And the challenge for us, I think, in India is to see how they can coexist and that one doesn't overrun the other in this space, particularly in which the small scale and the craft industry gets, you know, Fortunately, what we have seen in the past few years, there has been a resurgence in India and a much greater awareness towards uh, craft. And uh, I'm told by the several people I've been asking this question to, is that there have been more opportunities in some areas. Some crafts, of course, have not survived, but many have and have been able to uh, find a place for themselves. Because I mean, I'm just, I'm bringing in the, it, I'm looking at it from the perspective of an economic perspective. And um, as I think the two coexist, I think we've also, if they are to coexist, we also have to realize that we're going to have to slowly move the handmade and the craft, which is very, very valuable, which is actually a very, very valuable skill, slightly higher up the, the ladder of value, the value chain. And it is ultimately, in, I think the ultimate definition, we keep talking about luxury. Luxury is the word that is thrown about in the fashion business, you know, almost it's just like everyone talks about luxury. It means nothing really. All luxury really means is it costs, it's very, very expensive. It's just an appellation for, you know, overpricing a product in many, many cases. There are some genuine cases, of course, where the workmanship, the design and the craft are exemplified in luxury products. But in many cases, it really isn't. It's just a marketing term. But as we all are now across the world, I think across every society beginning to realize and value 
uh, artisan, artisanal work, craftsmanship. It's not just in fashion, it's in food. It's in everything that we are consuming now. We are becoming, we are beginning to realize that this is a very viable option and we have to be able to support these products. Indian craft must move into this area faster and faster. It already has captured a fair amount of that space. But I think we also need to protect it. It needs to be policy support. We need to move it up the value chain. We need to make it a very attractive source of income for the craftsperson. We have to find, um, it's not just fashion, it's across, it's everything. It's from architecture to interior design to every area of product that is manufactured today. We need to find ways in which we can um, celebrate and show the finest that can be done and set higher levels of uh, value so that this becomes a more, it becomes truly a luxury. And it is actually one of the last luxuries we have in the world is to have something. I mean, look at Khadi, for example. You have a fabric that is hand woven from a yarn that is hand spun. And as Aditi was talking about the plainness of white, where you don't even need to introduce color or pattern. If you look at the beautiful Khadi fabric, whether it is in a very coarse weave or whether it's the finest 300 count from Bing West Bengal, you can see the texture, every bit, every movement of, um, of the maker's hand is reflected in the yarn, both in the warp and in the weft and in the beating, in the actual weaving process. That is luxury. I mean, that is the most incredible piece of cloth because it doesn't reproduce and every individual maker leaves a stamp. Now we have to start, the discourse has to move in this direction, it already has, but we have to reiterate this till we, uh, till we are all hoarse. I think this is something that we need to keep talking about. And this is not to, I'm not discounting the industrial. I'm not discuss, discounting mass manufacture. I'm talking about both coexisting. Both have very different places. Both have very different needs. But this is one way that we can try and ensure that they both, that they both survive. I mean, that this survives along with this. I think this might be a great point, Aditi, to sort of get into your presentation. Yeah. Then seems like a natural turn to take this conversation into. Is that visible? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, so I've just, I'd like to share a few examples and uh, these are mostly uh, graphs which use natural material like palm leaf, sarkanda, grass, bamboo, because I think um, not only because they are sustainable, but all these examples um, show the other side of our story, which is not only trained designers who participate in this process, of, uh, of contemporary expressions, but also people who are self-trained uh, or people who are entrepreneurs and then, you know, through their intervention and their mediation, uh, you have a, a whole range of products which give sometimes a new lease of life to languishing traditional crafts. Um, on your left-hand side here, you can see examples of bamboo basketry but used for lamps in interiors and i think architecture really is the the space where um, sorry this is moving far too far and i think architecture really is the space where i think even you don't have to worry about whether a basket or a product made which was earlier a basket and a new contemporary version of it has a function or not uh, it definitely brings a warmth to the interior and it does as much or much more than even say in a very contemporary and modern interior uh, where you have glass and metal. Uh, it, it feels just right to have a craft, uh, had to have a basket because the basket brings in warmth. It is a natural material made from uh, either of these three materials or similar natural materials. Uh, it also brings a sense of history and culture into the space. 
so these are examples here developed by Sonam Tashi in Sikkim. And you can see basketry techniques uh, uh, which have been uh, used for lamps uh, in very contemporary settings. And you can see the very diffuse light that uh, is permeated through this very lattice-like uh, surface, which is possible because of the interlacing of uh, the bamboo strips. So uh, I think a lot of basketry, uh, textiles and basketry have a lot of overlap and share uh, a common sensibility. Uh, these are palm leaf crafts of Tamil Nadu on the upper, in the upper row, you can see these are traditional products. Um, there are uh, carrying baskets. There are, this is a set of nesting baskets used by a community in the north, in, um, sorry, this keeps shifting. Um, and you find the winnowing tray, you find a water pitcher, uh, and you can see what happens when there is a collaboration between a designer or an entrepreneur with, and with skills of sensibilities of design. Uh, and collaborates with the traditional craftsmen to produce new offerings for a totally different situation, a totally different context, um, but using the same um, uh, same principles and the, and the same uh, concepts which are present, such as stacking and uh, such as nesting, which you uh, which you can't see in this picture, but which is inside this basket. And you can see how it is reinterpreted and reimagined as trays, which are nesting trays, nesting baskets. And this is a basket for carrying babies. So this is done in the southern part of Tamil Nadu. And uh, these are uh, used by several communities. The traditional products are used by all the communities in the region. Uh, a similar material, palm leaf, but a very different level of craftsmanship and skill, uh, which was done in Chetinad. These are traditional basketry called cotton, made from palmera or palm leaf. Uh, they are very unique because of their craftsmanship, also because they are double layered. Um, they are double layered, and if you can see the way in which they have been finished. So there's a technique of um, plating. These are all plated. And this one, after it has been uh, in the process of plating, is also a kind of embroidery technique, uh, which is uh, unique and peculiar to the region of uh, Chetinad, which is in the southern part of Tamil Nadu. And this is an example uh, I, I'd like to share because it's done by, um, the, it's initiated by Vishalakshi Ramaswamy. Um, and she st who started the MRMRM Cultural Foundation in Chennai. And now there's a whole uh, very, very wide range of gift items, baskets, trays, uh, a whole lot of new offerings because of a revival of this languishing craft. So you can see the kind of um, uh, process that happens, the design process. This is the basket. And you can see what happens uh, when you have the rim, uh, which is difficult to perhaps use it um, as it is. So the, the, the modifications that happen, this has become, the rim is still stronger, but has been replaced with thread. And it is, uh, you know, nicer to feel or when it comes close to the body or for you to handle it. Uh, these make excellent uh, gift items and then they have been used for as gift items by many people. Uh, and you can see here that uh, Vishalakshi also has um, used and found a sort of a, a, an expression that comes from the technique itself. So the method of uh, generating different patterns using colors borrows from the method of plating, uh, which is essential to this basket. Uh, these are also seamless constructions. So I think that also lends itself to the shape, uh, um, besides the fact that they are stacking. 
So if I can go back to this, um, it's not only about how design uh, revives and how design as a tool for, for bringing about a change. This illustrates that very well. There's not only revival of uh, languishing craft, but also um, teaching women to learn a new skill, training them, setting them up as self-sustaining self producer groups. Uh, it's also educating, uh, not only the uh, bringing training inputs, not only to the craftspeople, but also to the customers. So uh, here are customers who perhaps would have selected plastic or some other uh, gift containers are now willing to look at a very, very different sensibility, are willing to learn to appreciate a very different kind of sensibility, very vivid use of uh, bright colors. And um, I, I think design does both. It not only uh, imparts skills and uh, brings in uh, economic uh, gain and brings in an economic change, but also in terms of changing the aesthetic uh, and sensibilities of the customer as well. Um, I would like to show yet another example where the uh, Jasmina Zelian, again an entrepreneur who's um, uh, got uh, set up two workshops, two of her design companies, one cane concept where she does makes furniture and the second is uh, Heirloom Naga, which uh, produces uh, textiles woven on the backstrap loom, which is indigenous and, and endemic to the northeastern region of India. And here you can see that uh, she has uh, really understood her tradition, which these, this is the traditional basket. And you can see that its form uh, is a direct response to the terrain, to walking on the hills where you need to uh, sort of um, uh, manage the slope of the hills and to carry loads. You need your hands free for walking. And this shape, the construction and the way the basket is designed actually responds perfectly for that situation. But what she has done is used all of these ingredients, but given it as a totally different offering. And not only that, she's also brought in uh, her, uh, her liking and appreciation for textiles, which she's from Nagaland, and she's, I'm sure, very well versed with all the uh, diverse uh, collections and uh, identities that, are, that each community has through their textiles. And she has managed to bring it into the baskets. I think in a way very different from most basketry forms that we see, because here you can see um, this is a direct uh, connection that you can make to the tradition. But this is something that is quite entirely different, which I would say is something that is unique offering that she is giving and bringing on the table. You can see here a whole collection that she has developed. Um, of course, uh, here these are dyed, whereas the original in the traditional form, they were all the natural color of the bamboo and cane strips. These are made from bamboo and cane. These are mostly made from bamboo, but these have been um, uh, these have been dyed in natural dyes. Uh, she's also developed a whole range of bamboo plates, which become um, a part of, which can be used in home, dec home decor, where the patterns are also very reminiscent of uh, tribal textiles. They are bold, geometric. And again, you can see here uh, the very typical use of uh, indigo and um, natural dyes. So this is also something that I, I think um, uh, you can easily associate and has a very strong uh, identity of the Northeast. So these are examples with basketry. And here you can see uh, a, a very unique form, I think. It's something that 
is probably very, very ubiquitous in, uh, in the north, especially in Haryana, from Delhi, Haryana, on the highway, where the, where the craftsmen sell these products. But it's also that it has entered most of our homes, whether they are in the cities or uh, whether they are farmhouses in the cities or resorts, um, of a chair that was developed from a traditional indigenous stool, because I don't think we had the tradition of furniture. We mostly did everything at uh, sitting was on the floor level. But low level seating is very much part of our traditional furniture. So it's an incredible, incredible uh, construction. Uh, and you can see it uses a plant, a grass called sarkanda. And the traditional form uses the uh, different parts of the leaf to make a product. So you can see here the reed uh, or the stem of the plant used uh, as the basic structure. And you can see that it is bound with the fiber and rope twisted from the same plant. So this is also a lesson in sustainability that was practiced and which is reflected in most of the crafts. Uh, as if you see even in the palm leaf where all parts of the palm uh, tree have been used either as a source of food or in crafts or in making um, rafts or you know in uh, there's nothing left of the tree which is which is wasted every part so it's resourcefulness at its i think at its peak uh, but here uh, with the collaboration of a designer and i think an entrepreneur such as fab india but perhaps uh, somebody else has done it i don't know but you can see how this um, the stool has got a natural extension of a single chair and then a double seater, triple seater sofa. And these forms are, I think, are quite like if you would carve a chair out of wood, which is done in the Northeast in Nagaland, because there's a seamless integration of the seat to the backrest and the armrest, which is quite unique. and which I think this is a very inexpensive alternative to wooden furniture. So these are also um, uh, concepts that uh, got promoted because of needs in the urban cities. So you have um, uh, a, a working together or a symbiotic relationship between different groups. The makers could be from urban uh, from rural areas and the users could be from urban areas uh, but we we need to ensure that you know there is uh, a fair trade uh, all the fair, fair trade practices are in place so that um, the craftspersons um, wages and earnings are um, uh, are done fairly and you know they are not exploited in the in this process of mass producing or uh, catering to very high-end markets. Uh, this is not a very high-end product, but I think it is in very many homes, and especially uh, young people who want to start their office or to start their homes, these invariably uh, become part of their uh, home spaces. So these are uh, a very few examples I thought which um, um, might help uh, illustrate where um, a traditional craft uh, does need, uh, would invite the participation of different professionals, uh, be it furniture designers, maybe architects, entrepreneurs who have an idea. Um, it might require people uh, for extracting fibers, you know, a lot of uh, the, the quality of the product also depends on the uh, process of extracting material from the uh, plant source itself. So there are so many aspects of science, of technology, and these inputs, I think, are what need to be brought in together. Um, and in a very symbiotic way, I think they need to work together 
so that we can develop products and these are being developed right now what i have shown you are all examples developed by people who have not gone to design schools and learnt i mean this is something they have done from their own exposure and their own ideas um, and this is what they have done working with the community but they did have a very strong they did have a vision and a will um, to work with the craft community they felt that the craft that they were uh, surrounded with or had lived with and had grown up with was part of their uh, upbringing was part of their culture is something that they wanted to uh, work with and bring um, you know so that there would be a better quality of life for everybody involved in the process so i think it works both ways it not only works where um, you know products you make products which are um, which respond to contemporary needs but i think that contemporary needs also influence how products and the making of products uh, uh, can be uh, understood and can be done professionally because i think today climate change and uh, the way uh, we are using the natural resources uh, i think these are very very important concerns for anybody engaged in the craft sector and with the craft sector and we definitely need to um, bring this kind of learning and understanding to make it a part of the process so that um, you know we don't end up introducing products which uh, create problems or which um, do not look at its impact or which do not leave the resource uh, leave resources for our future generations so before we open out to the audience questions david if you could respond uh, very quickly to um what the thing has been saying and what you sort of think um would be you know sort of your relationship with weavers or artisans who are actually helping you create your product and you know sort of um what do you think the responsibility of a designer would be in that space um i think we i can start i mean of course what's very interesting what we've just seen which is all the basketry uh work which you've been seeing that is being practiced right now in india is how strongly linked that is with textiles because they are plant essentially plant materials you know like linen cotton uh, flax i mean your palm leaves you know and the way you interweave two yarns together is very similar to the way you weave a basket together of course you use a different mechanism to do that so i think this in one way this demonstrates how wide the scope is um what is interest very interesting to me is that um there is a lot of intervention we can see i mean i know we as a brand a ant has been very responsible for introducing new ideas uh, with the crafts people that we work with with the weavers or the printers it's something we do every season so it's a continuing process and uh, what we've seen in the baskets also is how res uh, responsive it is to design input so how the entrepreneur not necessarily from a professional designer but also the entrepreneur herself generates new products this i think is a very key part of this whole discussion about design and craft is that craft is extremely flexible i think uh, there is there, there is a, there, there is one point of view which sort of tend to treat craft as something or traditional uh, textiles and craft as areas which are in silos which exist in silos and that need to be maintained at all costs and preserved i think tradition only survives if it is modernized if it's contemporary and if it becomes relevant to our lives and we can see this happening across textiles in bamboo craft and in all the other crafts is how willing the maker the crafts person and the artisan is to engage with this and this is not new this is historic i mean you know india in textiles i can talk about textiles more than i can talk about uh, in fact clothing more than baskets perhaps but i do know that we have been at one point in history the largest exporter and manufacturer of textiles in the world which is about 300 years ago because everything 
and the craftspeople who did that and the makers who did that were extremely skilled tradespeople too. They knew what the markets wanted. They gave them what the markets wanted. You can travel around the Coromandel coast and see the great chintzes of the Coromandel chintzes, which flooded Europe. And they gave them what they wanted. They incorporated their motifs. You'll find Western motifs taken from Dutch pattern books, which have been added into the block prints of, say, Machli Patnam. You will find checks, the, the famous Madras checks being woven for the African market out of Tamil Nadu. We've had a history of engaging with the world and providing them with designs, with products uh, that address their needs. And this has to be continued. And it does. I mean, I think the makers in India are very, very flexible about this. And we see it happening. And I think now, particularly in the fashion industry, I see a whole generation of young fashion designers or the, the designer, the generations after me, who are now very closely engaged with the crafts because they need the craftsperson to do it because at the, at the designer end of the market where volumes are small, uh, this is an ideal base to manufacture your product. And plus you have access to a huge number of skills, which you don't really get in the industrial sector. In the industrial sector, you'd need to make 5,000 meters for it to be viable. In the handloom sector, you can weave 150 meters and it's a viable product. And you can incorporate a lot of techniques which can't be done with that kind of flexibility. So we are seeing this link now, and it's adding to the vocabulary of uh, the craft, the particular craft that's being worked with. And this is where design, it's not just the designer, it's the market and the maker, all three together combine and create a product which is relevant. And um, I think it's our response. I mean, this is something that we have been talking about, and I think it's something that we all believe must continue and there must be greater engagement, both from the consumer, as well as the maker, as well as the entrepreneur and the designer. Everybody has to be involved in this process. If that's a response to your question, Shilpa. Yes. So we're running very short on time. So I'm going to take uh, one question from the audience for both of you. So um, Aditi, if you could go first and then David, but you only have about two minutes each. So um, you have to hold up your hold up your finger. <laughs> when the two minutes is up. <laughs> so Deepthi Rao asks, um, now that the handloom boards have been dismantled, can you envision other alternatives that might be able to fill the gap that now exists in the craft sector? Yes, I think they, uh, they could easily be other forms of associations. You already have alternative marketing based on the traditional heart which is you know which is the nature bazaar organized by laila and Dilli heart so similarly i think they they could be a, a, you know a forum a platform which could bring all the stakeholders together what it actually is i think we should involve the crafts persons what happens mostly is that um, we are very well-meaning, but we do all the thinking for the crafts community. So I think it has to be something that can be evolved with all the people, uh, especially the crafts people involved. I've been in um, many uh, organizations where uh, you're invited, where I'm invited to say a general body meeting of the trust or the organization but you find very few crafts people who are members of the steering committee or or governing council or whatever these big uh, committees are now it would make a lot of difference if the stakeholder is very much a part of these meetings not just that uh, uh, it's done by you know other professionals but including professionals such as the crafts people themselves but what it should be exactly, I, I don't know. We'll have to brainstorm and figure out uh, what kind of a platform can be created. Um, okay, David, I'm going to throw a different question at you from Shubhne Jain, who asks, what is the difference between ANT's ideology and when looking at craft or the traditional and cultural knowledge of crafts? 
Um, how is it different from other brands doing the same thing where they only sort of take techniques from older craft traditions? Um, well, like perhaps the difference might be slightly in approach because maybe we are looking at it from a more holistic view. Looking at that, we're looking at this at the final design product as the result of a very long and evolved ecosystem, and uh, you know this is the result of it. And and in, in perhaps in another brand, they would just look at the craft and they would uh, see what is available and use it as it is without getting involved in the. But having said that, I don't really think that one is necessarily, I mean, you know, I can't take a view that our approach is better than the other approach. I'm just very happy that all the brands are using the craft. I mean, go for it. Even if you don't really know the process, even you use it, use it, use it. Buy your fabric from the handloom sector, work with the handloom weavers, work with the hand embroidery carriers. This is what the fashion industry has to do. And as consumers, please go ahead and buy this product. That's my message. Well, that's a brilliant note to end this session <laughs> on, reiterating and underlining everything we've talked about. So thank you both so much for coming um, on this event today, for giving us such an educational um, hour and all of your time and your insights. Um, we hope that uh, we'll be able to collaborate with you and see you sometime in the future in Bangalore at MAP and the BIC. And for everyone else who attended, um, thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope we'll see you at our next MAP talk in October. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you. Aditi, lovely talking to you as yeah. always. We'll continue the conversation, of course, yes, very, very yes. soon. Yes, of course, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.